Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we are getting into Predator versus Wolverine. And from what I can tell, Marvel's doing something very different with the Predator now. Cause in this four part series, they're taking a turn from what's been previously done in the Marvel Predator entries. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so starting this out, we begin in Canada, present day, with an opening scene that's meant to seem like it's the end for Wolverine, cause he's in bad condition, his shoulders missing, blood's dripping, he's leaving a trail as far as the eye can see. And we're shown that he's being followed when three dots just appear on his head just seconds before he's nearly blasted again. And it's like now with the three dot targeting system, the heat vision perspective following him, and the shot from the plasma caster, we're given the clear indication of a predator closing in. And I really like the way that this is set up, because diving into this, Wolverine's thinking to himself about how they say that he's the best there is, but right now he doesn't feel that way. Now that he's the hunted, and he's the prey. Which takes us to the point where Wolverine's chased to the edge of a cliff in what's said to be the final moments of the hunt as he hides under the ledge. And one of the main reasons why I really like how this is done, it's cause this sets us up to continue following Wolverine's thoughts as they lead us into a sequence of flashbacks, which in my opinion is the best way to handle this cause Wolverine has such a long, rich past that allows for stories like this to be just trickled in throughout the years. But with how this is done, the first one takes us to the year 1900 when he was living in Alaska. And at this point in Wolverine's life, he's much younger. He still has the bone claws. And most of what he did for a living at the time was hunting and gathering, ice fishing, so he could sell the goods at local trades alongside of furs and things of that nature. Cause he's good at killing. So this occupation just came natural to him. Cause he also saw it as work that didn't require too much thinking. Cause also he remembers that he wasn't the type to set traps either. So he wasn't a trapper by trade. Cause for one, he didn't have the patience, but number two, he could make just as much, if not more by way of hunting. And when it came down to selling goods, he would only sell to make just enough money for him to get by and everything else he would keep in the bear cave. So no one in their right mind would go in there, which for him made it as good as a safe. And just after this, we're shown a predator landing its ship and traversing in this same general area. And though we're not told exactly why this predator has come here, soon after his arrival, we're kind of given an idea when he finds another predator who's been killed by the locals, which is crazy to see because it's a sign that predators have been around and hunting in the main Marvel universe, which I think is something that kind of kicked off with Marvel's 2022 six issue Predator series written by Ed Brisson. And I only say kind of, because that series references the events that took place in the films, making references to 1987, 1997, 2010, and 2018, while that series itself takes place in the year 2056. So though it's published by Marvel, I don't think it's trying to exist in the main Marvel universe, but instead both the 2022 and the recent 2023 series, they read like extensions of the films that expand the story yet exist in their own universe. And just to be clear, I'm not a Predator expert. There's a lot of Dark Horse Predator comics that I haven't read. So I'm not sure if there's things coming from those series into the new stories, but from what I've seen up until now, over the past year or so, Marvel's just been keeping the Predator universe to itself and off to the side, at least up until now. Cause with this story, it seems like that's changing and I'm not even mad at it. But as this Predator finds the other one here, he takes his shuriken and he uses it right away to hunt a number of different animals. And when he does, initially it comes off as if he's more so doing target practice before he goes out there and begins to hunt. Because when he starts throwing it, we see him miss a target before he hits one. And when he does, he goes for another and eventually it bleeds out. And just after this, he puts it away as he goes off to hunt other animals with the weapons that he brought, like his dagger, his wrist blades, and his combi stick as well. And when we see him use these weapons, he's way more efficient and precise. But after some time of it hunting these different animals within the local area, it notices some clouds of smoke coming from a nearby village. So it switches the heat vision, activates its cloak, and it goes to check it out. And as it would appear, upon a closer look, it seems like the hunters here were using the same spears that took down the other predator who was defeated. So this one goes to work at proving he was better than the last. 
And next, when we go back to Wolverine, we find that he's made his way to an outpost that's mostly populated by loggers, trappers, and miners, which at this time Wolverine would usually avoid unless he needs money or supplies. Cause though at the time Alaska was a place for a young Wolverine to run away to and start over, it also was considered to be the edge of the map. So it collected a number of people who were either trying to escape trouble or make some more. But while he's here, he's approached by this gentleman named Tucker who's initially just buying him drinks before asking for a moment of his time. But Wolverine just tells him, hey, you be smart to stay clear of me. So Tucker asks why, and he tells him it's cause things are about to get ugly, which is precisely what happens, like clockwork, as these two guys approach Wolverine because they know he's always got a lot to trade. So they hold him at gunpoint and ask him, where is he keeping his treasure? But to their surprise, Logan is more dangerous with a bottle of whiskey and a broken chair than they are with a pistol and a knife. And at one point, he stabbed the dude in the foot with his friend's knife, only to then go grab a saw and chop this guy's hand off. And they were done. But as Wolverine's leaving, he's chased down by Tucker, the other guy from inside, who's telling him the way that he handled those guys was remarkable and how Wolverine's just the person he needs. And with tears in his eyes, he lets him know that his son was kidnapped and being held for ransom in a cabin just 10 miles north of there. So Logan goes with them to head up to the cabin and save his son as the snowstorm picks up. But along the way, the horses get spooked and they run off, leaving them to head the rest of the way on foot. And with Wolverine picking up a scent from some nearby bushes, he goes to check it out, only to find a number of people and animals skinned and hung from their feet on the other side. Which for us, we know the predator did this because at times they'll skin their prey as a taunt or a showcase until they find something that's more worthy to hunt so that they can take their skull as a proper trophy. But with seeing this, Tucker, he's looking like he ain't know these guys were this crazy. And he tells Wolverine that it's the guys that they're after that did this. They're killers, they're monsters. So they continue to make their way, not knowing that the predator is watching their every step. And soon after, when they make their way to the cabin, Tucker tells Wolverine to be swift and show no mercy. And that's exactly what he does, kicking in the door, cutting and slicing these guys up left and right, demanding that they tell him where the kid is. And as soon as Wolverine's done killing every last one of them, he's shot in the back by Tucker, who then tells Wolverine that these guys were guns that he hired some time back to do jobs for him. But on the last job, Tucker commissioned a railroad robbery and these guys just kept the bonds and the cash. So he set this whole thing up just to rob them. And as he walks out the door, he gets his head blown clean off by the predator. And it's like, man, his karma got expedited. And as the predator goes to grab Tucker's headless body, Wolverine drops down and these two go at it. And in this fight, we get this moment where Wolverine cuts the predator just under its mask, like right under its chin. So it takes its bio mask off, giving Wolverine his first look at this thing. And he's like, whatever you are, I'm gonna carve the ugly off of you and this predator just breaks off all three claws on one of his hands and impales him, which isn't fatal to Wolverine, but it gives us this really cool moment where the two of them are injured, so Wolverine limps outside to pull out the combi stick so his healing factor can take care of the rest, while the predator opens up his medicom and treats his injuries, and at the same time, they both give off that primal scream, which all together adds the little things that make it really feel like a predator story. But after this, the young Wolverine, he takes off running. Cause even at this point in his life, he's seen a number of fights. And though he's not usually one to just run away from a fight, he does know if he's gonna win this one, he's gotta be smart. So what he does, he ends up running back to his safe or the cave where he keeps his stuff, luring the predator all the way there, just in front of the entrance, knowing that the bear would come out and pretty much take it from there. Which I will admit was a pretty clever move on Wolverine's part. Cause at this point in time, for him at least, he wasn't about to take this predator down by himself. And as the bear drags the predator inside the cave, young Wolverine celebrates this win just before he heads back into town. Cause there's a trade representative coming the next day. And the whole reason he was initially there was to meet them. But after he leaves, the predator walks out the cave, holding up the bear's head. And the first thing that I thought when I saw this was, man, if Wolverine had only heard that mystical freestyle, where mystical was like, if you ever see me fighting in the forest with a grizzly bear, help the bear, cause that go need it. <laughs> Let me stop. I got a feeling some of y'all ain't even gonna know what I'm talking about, but it's all right. And after this, we jump forward years later to a time when Wolverine's memories weren't the best. After getting his mind wiped multiple times by Professor Thornton, paired with the rigorous training, that Wolverine received while he was a member of Team X. 
which was a small group of CIA mutant operatives that Wolverine served with between the years of 1961 and 1968 working under the radar as a small army. And though this team seems a little different, I'm sure it's just to serve the purpose for this specific story that's coming. Cause at this time, when we find them in South America, Wolverine remembers saying that their intel told them guerrilla forces were planning a coup. A former general was storing weapons and rallying support from a jungle stronghold. We were supposed to make sure he never came to power. Everything was sleepy and quiet at dawn. Once we took out the sentry, it would be easy pickings, or so we thought. Cause when they move in, these guys are already dead and skinned, which triggers the memory for Wolverine about the Predator. Cause after all the memory wiping and the fake memories being planted between missions, he may have forgotten about the Predator, but the Predator didn't forget about him. As the net gun goes off, trapping Cruel. And as Wolverine looks up, he sees that not only is the Predator back, but this time he's brought reinforcements. Cause now there's four of them. All right, so coming back, we pick up in the present day, continuing the main story of what's happening now with Wolverine in Canada being hunted down by the Predator. Cause even with this series jumping throughout time with these multiple flashbacks, each of these issues tell a story that we see progress one issue after the other as they build up to the finale. And right now, when we come back to Wolverine, like we saw before, he's not doing too well because after the Predator chased him off a cliff, Wolverine just hid underneath to give his healing factor some time to mend him back together. And right now, he's just thinking to himself that he doesn't know how long he's been hanging on here and whether that's been 10 minutes or a whole hour. And eventually, Wolverine takes a chance and he decides to climb out from his hiding spot because based on his experience with the Predator over the years, he's noticed that the creature is stubborn but also impatient. So Logan makes the assumption that the Predator's moved on and it's looking for him elsewhere. But while Logan's climbing out from his hiding spot, his foot slips causing rocks to stumble down the cliff and this is enough to get him spotted. And just like that, the hunt is on again as beams shoot at Wolverine, forcing him to jump off the cliff falling 200 feet into the river. And as he does, once again, he's just thinking to himself as far as what's happening and what he's going to do. And it's right here where we find him thinking about how ever since his bones were infused with adamantium, maneuvering underwater has become extremely difficult to him. And with that in mind, it doesn't help that right now, after falling in the water, he's quickly pinned by the avalanche of rocks that came down just behind him, leaving him helpless as the Predator closes in. And I also want to point out that this time, as we get a better look at the Predator in the current day, we see that it has the five claw marks on its face, just like we saw at the end of the first issue, which going forward, narratively, this makes it easier for us as the reader to point him out in a group of other Predators for a portion of the story to come. So just keep that in mind. And just after this, we return to Wolverine's Team X flashback, where much like we saw before, Gruel was the first to go since one of the Predators caught him by surprise, tagging him with the net gun, which for the rest of Team X, this was confirmation of danger close. And from here, with the five Predators moving in, led by the one with the scarred mask, who Wolverine encountered roughly 60 years ago, he sees Wolverine wearing the shuriken around his neck, which is the same one that we saw the Predator throw that got caught in the back of Logan's leg. And the way that he explains the reasoning behind him keeping it, because in a way it comes off like it's the same for the Predator, with it keeping its mask, and holding on to those scars as a reminder. But for Logan, since he can't keep physical scars, instead for him, something like this shuriken he would keep as a reminder, a relic of the pain he experienced. And I imagine because getting their minds wiped between missions was a regular thing for Team X, holding on to this shuriken served as a reminder for the feeling at the time more so than the memories that wouldn't come back to him until much later. But right away when he sees the Predator, he knows that they're connected and it has something to do with this shuriken somehow. So he looks up at the Predator and he's like, you want this, don't you? And Wolverine throws it. And even though it misses the Predator from his past, dude moves out the way and it hits the other one behind him. And the crazy thing with seeing this is Wolverine's able to throw it, have it come back and catch it. And the reason this is wild to see is because for Predators, shurikens are similar to smart discs because they both can be used for melee or thrown at a target. And they both have tech built into them to increase the chances of it hitting their target. But more often than not, you'll see a Predator use a smart disc then you will see it use a shuriken because many of the smart discs, they can be piloted, they're more accurate to throw, they're lighter, and there's a higher probability of it returning without using the smart tracking in instances where the Predator's tracker may be damaged. So overall, smart discs are way more versatile and more commonly used because cutting wise, they can still split somebody in half or take down a tree. 
but in the case of shurikens, they got those six long blades, so for melee use, they can make a clean cut through something larger, like a xenomorph. So it's arguably better in that use case, but when it comes down to throwing a shuriken, because of the six long blades, there's a significantly lower chance that the shuriken will return, because more often than not, it'll get lodged into something, like in the Alien vs Predator movie. But sometimes this will be what a predator wants, like in the 2018 Predator film, when one was used to lift the target and pin it to the wall, or the inside of a van I think it was. But I say that to say this, if you see a predator, throw a shuriken, hit a target, and then catch it, it's very much considered to be a Yautua flex. Cause like we saw in the last issue, this shuriken didn't originally belong to the predator. Wolverine fought roughly 60 years prior to Team X, cause he found it on another dead predator when he arrived on Earth, picked it up, started tossing it around, and sure, yeah, he was able to hit a target with it. But at the time, you could see his frustration when he didn't get the results he wanted and went back to the weapons he brought with him. So yeah, I say all that to say this. Jumping forward to this point, to see Wolverine use this shuriken, throw it, have it make contact and then catch it with no targeting system. It's wild to see. So I just imagine these predators feel some type of way about that. But just after this, Wolverine tells Maverick, Sabretooth and Jackson all to fall back. But Sabretooth is just like, F that. And he lets off with the minigun, which is precisely what I would expect from Sabretooth in this time era. The only thing missing here is him toting on a stogie. But here's the thing, back when him and Wolverine were on Team X, there were times when Sabretooth would just kill someone to get under Wolverine's skin and make sure that he wasn't growing a conscious out in the field which is crazy, this guy was an animal. But the reason that Wolverine's telling his team to fall back, it's not because he's the type to run away from a fight, cause any other day he'd run into trouble head first. But because right now they're fighting an invisible enemy, who Wolverine only halfway remembers, and it's got him like, whoa, we need to create some distance, think this one out, and come up with a strategy for these things. But of course, for Sabretooth, he's like, if I shoot everything, I'ma hit something. And it only leads to one of these predators sneaking up behind him and stabbing him in the back with a combi stick, which would have been lethal to most. But to this predator's surprise, Sabretooth just turns around and pulls him into it. But as Wolverine, Maverick, and Jackson are falling back in hopes of getting somewhere where they can regroup, Maverick is asking Logan what these things are cause he saw one of them back there use its gauntlet to ping the weapon that Wolverine's been wearing. So Maverick's putting two and two together cause he just figures that Wolverine's gotta know something. But of course, after all the mind wipes between their different missions over the years, as far as the memories go, Wolverine's only got bits and pieces. But as they're making their way, one of these predators catches Jackson. And I mean, I'm not gonna say it, but it's unfortunate. Cause just seconds later, her body falls with no head. So Wolverine picks up her gun and him and Maverick just start shooting into the trees as a bomb that was still attached to Jackson's body goes off, sending a piece of debris into Maverick's leg. So now he's not able to walk. But as Wolverine's taking a look and telling Maverick that he's lucky because it missed his femoral artery by an inch, Maverick sees this predator jump down and come after Wolverine. And in the nick of time, he's able to light this thing up just before it gets to carving into these guys, which now gives the two of them a little bit of time as Wolverine picks up Maverick and heads for cover while telling him to keep his finger on the trigger and watch their six. And right here as the other predators see the two of them head for cover, we get this moment where we're shown an example of how on the flip side predators handle one another when they find one of their own injured or left immobilized by their prey before the hunt is finished. Cause right here the two of them just kill the guy and it's something that we rarely see. But from what I'm aware, a predator will only kill another one in an instance like this where they're considered a failure or if one of them has gone rogue and considered to be a fugitive where in that case they're labeled as a bad blood and they're just taken out because of whatever crime or treason they committed. And of course you have your other exceptions because they have had civil disputes on things like whether a predator should mix their DNA with other species and whether that's right or wrong or if they all should be purebloods. But I don't think this story is diving too much into any of that. But right here with Wolverine and Maverick making their way inside of this temple, they find a stockpile of explosives that belong to the general, which they knew about heading into this with it being part of the reason why they came here to kill him. But come to find out, the general, along with what's left of his men, were laying low in here too. And when he sees Wolverine and Maverick, he knows that they came here to kill him. So Wolverine's just like, okay, if you know why we're here, then go ahead and shoot. But instead, the general tells him that those things out there cut through his men like machetes through grass. He doesn't know what they are or why they're here, but what he does know is that they're a bigger threat than either of them have faced. So he makes a smart call and he more or less tells Wolverine that their best bet is to put their differences aside and work together. 
and Wolverine agrees, but he tells the general that they're doing it his way. And then, about an hour later, with there being no sign of the last two predators making any moves, one of the general's men is like, hey, you think they left? And right away, Buddy catches a plasma cannon shot to the dome as the other two soldiers who are left just get rushed by the last two predators who are showing off their skills with the wrist shields, bouncing back bullets for headshots while the other one is throwing the shield and cutting a dude in half. It's wild. And after killing these soldiers, the predator who's known Wolverine for some time uses his gauntlet once again to ping the location of the shuriken. And as soon as him and the other predators see where it's at, they let off plasma shots. But after, when they go in closer to investigate, they only see the shuriken there as opposed to more bodies. And right away, the whole stockpile of bombs in the temple starts beeping, just before they detonate and blow the place sky high. And Wolverine recalls at the time when Professor Thornton flew in via chopper to extract Team X from this location in South America. Professor Thornton wanted a confirmation on the kill, and Wolverine assured him that everyone and everything was dead down there, which on one hand was him staying true to his agreement with the general so they can get out of there alive. But also at the time, this is Wolverine genuinely believing that he killed the last two predators. But as it turns out, at least one of them made it out alive. And after this, we then jump forward again, years later to Alberta, Canada at the Weapon X facility, where at this point in time in Wolverine's past, we all know this is where he gets his adamantium. And with the predators showing up here, it's just got my excitement level through the roof. But when it gets here, we see it take down these guards and it's squeezing what seems to be xenomorph blood all over one of these guys' face. It's killing any and everyone it's seen across the Weapon X facility, making its way deeper inside until eventually it finds Wolverine, who's recently had his bones bonded with adamantium. And I imagine because Wolverine is pretty much helpless at this point, the predator is just going to decide to walk away because it's rare that they would kill someone unarmed and it's pretty much a taboo to kill someone in their sleep. So from here, with us knowing that Wolverine is approaching a moment in his life where he's unleashed in a very feral and untamed state. Alright, so with us coming back, we start off by returning to the present day and picking up right where we left off with Wolverine trapped under two tons of rubble at the bottom of the river with the Predator closing in quickly for the kill. But just before he can get to Logan, it's here where we see some of Logan's recollection come into play for his benefit in this moment that would seem to be the end for him. Because again, from the start of this series, all the way up to now, with us going back and forth from the present day to a number of moments throughout Wolverine's life, these moments and these memories are helping Wolverine to assess the situation now and figure out how not only to survive, but also beat the Predator at his game. And I can't stress enough, I really feel like Benjamin Percy hit the nail on the head with this approach. And it's here when we get some narration of what Wolverine's thinking in this moment, where he's like, the Predator thinks that he has him. But there's something that he knows that the Predator doesn't, and that's the fact that hunting is elemental. You study dirt for tracks and spore. You know what's growing or hatching or breeding. You know where to find water and shelter. It's not about the gear. And as Wolverine's saying this, he lets himself just bleed out to the point where a lot of his warm blood just fills the water, making it impossible for the Predator to keep a thermal visual on him. Which again, it's not only Wolverine using the element of the hunt to work to his advantage and get him out of this, but it's also him pointing out that the Predator relies too much on its gadgets and its gear, which to Wolverine, that's no different than those big game hunters who drop 20 bands on laser sights and multiple caliber rifles and all sorts of tech for the sake of trophy hunting. And Wolverine says at the end of the day, if they were true hunters, they could accomplish the same task with just one blade, or perhaps even three. Because the fancier the tech, the cockier you get. And I'm just like, man, look at Logan with the slogans. But nonetheless, with creating this diversion, Logan's able to buy enough time to carve his way out and create some space between himself and the Predator. And just after this, we head back to continue the most recent flashback at the Weapon X facility, where the Predator found Wolverine just after his adamantium bonding process. Where at this time, initially the Predator just starts doing an evaluation of what exactly is going on here. And what's really interesting is that we see him checking out the screens and learning about adamantium. So with the Predator discovering that Wolverine's entire skeletal structure has been bonded with this indestructible metal, that can't be found anywhere else, this now lets him know that not only is Wolverine a rare and valuable trophy, but this guy is a platinum trophy, and he's a plat that is not likely that any other predator will ever come by. And it's a serious deal, because the Yaucha already consider humans to be their top two or top three most deadly prey, which I imagine is a hierarchy that's gonna change now that we're throwing mutants into the mix. 
But when you take a mutant like Wolverine, who is now bonded with a metal that can't be found anywhere else in the universe, this elevates him from being a rare trophy to now being like a platinum trophy that got removed from the PlayStation Store. So after you get it, nobody else can. And with saying that, I also want to put out there that we're talking about a time in Marvel Comics where, for the most part, adamantium was exclusive to Wolverine. But over the years, this would change drastically, with writers giving countless others adamantium upgrades, like with Cyber, Lady Deathstrike, Bullseye, and the list goes on. Because prior to Wolverine, you really just had Ultron, who managed to obtain a limited amount of adamantium, which he used to mold into a new exterior in a story that came out like five years before Wolverine's first appearance. But over time, and especially after Wolverine and the success of his character, the practice of just giving everybody adamantium just kind of oversaturated and shifted the needle away from how rare adamantium used to be because it was introduced as your indestructible and extraordinarily rare material created by Dr. Myron McLean, who then sold it to the US government, who only shared the secret of how to make it with a short list of allies, which is how it made its way to Weapon X, since Weapon X was a joint project between the US and Canadian governments. But fast forward to your more modern times, you have cases like Ezekiel Sims, who we talked about not too long ago, where he made an adamantium safe room for Peter Parker to protect him from the inheritor Morlun, and aside from that, now you have have other cases like Weapon H, who's been infused with nanite adamantium tech so that the adamantium around his skeleton can expand when he hulks out and contract when he's back to a normal size. So yeah, I say all that mainly just to say that in this story we are revisiting a time where adamantium was actually rare. And I truly believe that that's a point that's important to this moment in this story for a number of reasons and we'll come back to more of those in a little bit. But in this moment, while the Predator is examining Wolverine, it's here where Wolverine recalls that back at this time, just after the process, he was in a state where he had very little intellect or thought. But the one thing that he could interpret in this moment was pain, which is what caused him to wake up with his claws out and thrust them right into the Predator, which then just leads to the Predator squeezing some more of what seems to be Xenomorph blood into Logan's mouth that just melts his whole head down to the adamantium which from here has the Predator believing that Wolverine is dead. And you know, I really don't blame the Predator for making that assumption. Though for us, we know that's definitely not the case due to this being a flashback. And from here, the Predator just takes Wolverine's body back onto his ship so he can head out. And with how this is done, I really like that Benjamin Percy throws in Wolverine's narration with Wolverine explaining that the only way he knows the details of moments like this, for the most part, is from playing detective and patching together security footage together with the actual bits and pieces of memories that he has. Because it's not like his healing factor allows his memory to have total recall. And I like that we get that bit of extra explanation here. But when we see the Predator take Wolverine's body on his ship, we see a wall filled with its previous trophies. And I want you guys to let me know in the comments if you recognize any of these trophies here and tell me what you think some of them are. But right now, with the Predator bringing Wolverine on the ship and getting ready to leave, it removes its helmet and treats its wounds. But not long after this, the Predator finds itself under attack by two F-16s which just makes a lot of sense because Weapon X is a multi-billion dollar project so it makes sense that they would scramble jets to try to stop someone from stealing their invaluable asset and I also like how when this happens we have two pilots here one is named Swartz and the other one is named Weathers which if nothing else is just a really cool reference to the first Predator movie and as the Predator ship takes off, it shoots down Weathers, which is messed up, and it heads straight up, leaving the atmosphere. And it's right here where a still yet reforming Wolverine wakes up in a berserker rage, and he just starts clawing his way out of the ship like an animal digging its way out of a trap. And again, for Wolverine calling back to this moment, it isn't so much that he remembers exactly what happened, but again, it's a collection of him looking through mission reports and discovering that the ship's hull wasn't broken by the missiles. So he more or less put two and two together and realized that it was likely a result of him clawing his way out in a berserker state because from there he was just yanked out of the ship alongside of the Predator's helmet where after that Swartz noticed the asset re-entering the atmosphere. So he called in the coordinates of where the asset landed and Professor Thornton made his way there to collect. But in addition to getting Wolverine back, the Professor also discovered the Predator's helmet nearby. And according to the different reports that Wolverine collected, he found out that the Predator's helmet was used and modeled after to produce the helmet that Wolverine used during the Weapon X program, which is a really wild connection. 
And I remember from the comments in the previous videos that a lot of you guys were just hoping to see some kind of connection where either Wolverine would influence the Predator's tech or vice versa. And now we're getting it here, which is nice. But after this, we jump forward to one week before the present day, where we find out that every so often, Wolverine will go through whatever records he can find to try to piece together the gaps of missing memories that he has, which is what led him back to the ruins of the old Weapon X lab, where in a lead-lined vault, in a lead-lined container, he found the Predator's mask. So he just figured if he took it out of this lead container, it would transmit a signal. And not too long after, the Predator would come back for it. In this way, the two of them could end this feud in the same place up north where it started. But this time around, Wolverine would be able to set the terms of their engagement. And after this, we go to the next flashback, which takes place after Weapon X, when Wolverine was living in Japan and training with the legendary swordsmith Muramasa, who for Muramasa, though he has quite the reputation of being a madman, his technique and craftsmanship were unmatched, with him forging weapons like the Black Blade, which was also known as the Sword of Evil, or as the Silver Samurai would call it at one point, the Blade of His Destiny. But as it were, the Black Blade was infused with a portion of Miramasa's soul, as well as his madness, and those who wielded it would become extremely powerful, but they would slip further into madness and be consumed by bloodlust, unless they were fated to be the sword's master, which could only happen if the wielder was just as driven as the blade itself. And aside from this, you also had the Muramasa Blade that was forged using a portion of Wolverine's soul that was capable of shutting down the healing factor or even healing ability of any person it cuts. But one of the things that made Muramasa the greatest swordsmith in the world was that his methods were based on refinement and a long process of perfection, which demanded impossible levels of patience. And this didn't only apply to his work as a swordsmith, but the same went for his fighting style and his training as well. And this is why at the time when Wolverine trained with Muramasa, he believed that Wolverine would one day become his strongest sword. But just to be clear, at this point in time, Logan is quite some way from getting to that point. But nonetheless, he does think back and remember how at this point in time in his life, he had never felt so close to peace and balance as he did here. Because prior to this, he never felt as much of a connection between his mind, his body, and the earth than he did during the time that he trained with Muramasa. So in a way, you can think of it as a mental and spiritual upgrade that Wolverine has gained since the last time he'd faced the Predator. And during this training, there's also this moment where Muramasa tells Logan that he won't be the best until he beats him. And Logan's just like, man, that's cause you won't let me use my claws. And Muramasa tells him, when the day comes that you can best me with a sword alone, you'll be able to fight 10 men or 100 men when you reach that level. But in the middle of this talk, Muramasa notices that they are not alone. And it's right here where we see that the Predator is back. And he's brought along with him a number of gear upgrades. Which right here just brings it all back to what modern day Wolverine mentioned earlier. With him saying that it's not about the gear. And his slogan, the fancier the tech, the cockier you get. Because going forward into the next issue, we're going to see how Wolverine's recent spiritual and mental upgrade fares against the Predator's gear upgrade because a true hunter can get the job done with either one blade or three. All right, so coming back, we continue to do the time jump between the modern day and moments from Wolverine's past. So starting out, as we're told it's the present day, but we're really continuing from one week ago in Canada when Wolverine took the Predator's helmet out of that lead box to lure the Predator out for one last round. Because as it turns out, when Wolverine did this, he waited here for a week until the Predator finally showed up. And initially when it did, the Predator was wearing the skull mask that we saw it wearing before at Miramasa's estate. And the story behind that's kind of crazy, but we'll, we'll get to it. But with the Predator arriving here around your present day, Wolverine set up a trap for it, an ambush. But not so much for the purpose of this trap actually catching the Predator, because Wolverine knew the Predator would expect a trap. He knew this thing was expecting to walk into some kind of danger. So by design, this trap was laid out for the Predator to find and avoid. So for a brief moment, he would gain a sense of confidence and let his guard down, which in a way is a bit of foreshadowing to the long game that Wolverine's playing. Cause he goes on to say that he needs to get hit. Wolverine needs his blood on the ground because once the Predator's got a taste of it and he's got his helmet back, the big guy's gonna think that he already won. And that's precisely how this goes, because Wolverine takes a hit, and as soon as he takes off, the Predator goes for that helmet. Because like he had mentioned before, technology's been the Yautja's failing, so by letting him get his helmet back, Wolverine just sees it as giving the Predator the tools of his own downfall. And you can tell the big guy's fallen for it so far, because he's so happy to get that helmet back after all these years. 
But just after this, we go back to Logan's memory from the Muramasa estate. And as soon as this picks back up, we see Wolverine yelling out to Muramasa, telling him a little help will be nice, only for Muramasa to tell him this is not my enemy. And I just imagine Wolverine fighting the predator right here while telling Muramasa like, ah, ah, but you said at the end of the last issue, we would fight together. And right there, Muramasa is just like, I lied. <laughs> and I mean, not really, but that's how it feels right now. Cause as Logan's teacher, Muramasa doesn't want to step in and rob Wolverine of this learning experience. So he stays off to the side, but he's still coaching here and there cause he got some things to say. Cause for starters, he tells Wolverine that this enemy has studied his fighting style with his claws and he's come here imitating what he's learned. So it's likely somebody's gonna die today, but this fight will determine which one of them is the better student. And whoever dies, Muramasa is just gonna forge their soul into his next blade. And he's like, either way, he's entertained. But it's not as if Muramasa wants Wolverine to die here, cause he continues to coach him on by telling him if he wants to know that he's the best between them, then he'll finish this fight with his claws and his anger sheathed. And you can tell as soon as Wolverine finds that focus, he catches a rhythm here. But Wolverine also goes on to say that seeing this predator's new helmet that was made out of a bear skull, it reminded him of a bear that needed help and didn't get it. <laughs> I mean, he ain't say it like that, but it is the bear's skull. And all in all, this predator's new armor, it's him making a statement that says he's come here to finish what he began. But as they're fighting, it comes to the point where the predator uses a plasma cannon, which knocks Wolverine's sword out of his hands. And as soon as that happens, Wolverine's like, man, bump this, I'm using claws. But as soon as he pops claws, the predator cloaks himself and he takes off, which at first has Wolverine thinking that the predator's just running from him. But instead it's cause the predator only came here to fight him. So now with the predator taking off, it's because the hand showed up. And looking back, Wolverine sees this as a moment where his enemy saved his life. And after this, we jump forward to another era in Wolverine's past, which now brings us to Westchester, New York at Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters. And I love the way that Wolverine paints the picture here, cause he says that his enemies saved him in Japan, but it was his friends who trapped him in New York, which to me just goes to show how much his heart was truly here at the time. Cause right now as all the students are eating dinner, Wolverine stepped outside to make his rounds and just check for intruders to make sure the kids are safe. But eventually Charles comes outside to tell him that he should come in and finish his dinner. Cause the students spend half the time looking at Wolverine's empty chair, especially Kurt and Kitty, which right there just pulls on my heartstrings. Cause you know Wolverine's relationship with the both of them is special. But while Charles is out here, three dots show up on his forehead. So Wolverine tackles him out of the wheelchair. Like get down, yeah. As a blast comes through, nearly taking Charles out. And it has me thinking, cause I never thought about this as a kid, but it has me thinking now as an adult, the insurance policy on Xavier's school had to be through the roof as many times as this place has been attacked and destroyed. But following this first blast, the Predator sends out four missiles, which cause even more damage, raising the deductible. So next, Colossus comes out to see what's going on. So Wolverine tells him to grab Charles and take him somewhere safe, preferably downstairs, as Wolverine rushes upstairs to check on the kids who were near the blast area. And though most of the kids were able to make their way downstairs safely, Wolverine ends up finding Kitty Pride, who's a bit out of it from the blast, but as he's checking on her to see if she's okay, the Predator catches him from behind, and after a stun hit that was a bit of a cheap shot, just after it then goes to stab Wolverine, only for Nightcrawler to make his way in the room and bamf Wolverine out of there just in time to take him downstairs with the other students. And right here, Wolverine just goes off, telling Kurt and everyone else here to stay out of this, which truly just shows you how much love and fear Wolverine was feeling in this moment for them, because he doesn't want anything to happen to these kids. And as he starts to head back upstairs, Kurt tells him that he doesn't have to do this alone. But Wolverine just refuses Kurt's help. And he tells him that this only proves what he believed before, which for Wolverine was the thought of him being here, putting everyone in danger. And just after this, upstairs, we see that the Predator has Rogue hostage. And she looks at Wolverine and tells him that she can take off her glove and touch him. She can help, but he's just like, no. And he tells the Predator to take him instead. And so the Predator drops the little handcuff things. And I'm just like, oh, look at this. You're out here negotiating with terrorists. But just outside, as the Predator takes Wolverine to his ship, another Wolverine comes running up. And to the Predator's surprise, the one that's running up is the real Wolverine. Because from the encounter with Rogue, where he made the exchange for Logan, it was actually Danny Moonstar. So next, Nightcrawler bamps out here. He's pulling tubes. Kitty Pride comes in with a sneak attack from underneath. She's hitting soft spots. And with the Predator taken down, Rogue just touches him. But eventually, after some time passes, 
the predator is able to cloak himself and get away. And as he does, I just imagine he thinking to himself, I ain't never, ever, 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 ever coming back to this school. Walking back to the ship like, man, them kids had me scared, but I held my own, bump that. And from here, we go forward to the present day for the final showdown in a moment that takes place after all the present day encounters we've seen so far. Cause right now the Predator's still trying to track down Wolverine after he got away from under those rocks in the water. And at this point, Wolverine mentions that he's aware of the Predator being able to pick up heat signatures and that mud could be used as a cloaking device. But when the Predator sees an eye peeking at him from a mud covered figure, he goes to stab it only to find that it's just an eye as a one eyed Wolverine jumps on the Predator's back, destroying his plasma cannon and shoulder armor. Cause Wolverine said, nah, I'm not doing the Arnold Schwarzenegger hiding in the mud. I'm Wolverine. I'm gonna take one eye out and have it just sitting by the water waiting for you. <laughs> like that, that was genius. And I highly doubt that this predator has seen anyone do that before. But what this does, it creates the scene where now the predator has to fight Wolverine with its blades versus his. So he pulls out his claws and his ceremonial dagger against Wolverine and his adamantium claws. And the two of these guys are just tearing each other up but only one of them's got a really good healing factor. So for the Predator, he knows he's fatally wounded. So part of his tradition as a hunter, he starts to count down on his wrist, cause the way he sees it, at this point, he's gonna have to collect this trophy from the grave. And as it counts down, Wolverine, he doesn't understand the language, but he recognizes the countdown. And in these final seconds, he just hopes that the Predator takes this L all the way to hell by himself, because after the insane explosion that just completely obliterates the Predator, Days later, after Wolverine has reformed his body on top of his adamantium skeleton, at this point, he feels a great deal of emptiness because there was just something about knowing that the Predator was out there that gave him a rush, and now it's gone. And he knows the Predator had that same feeling too, and all Logan can do now is just hope that the Predator feels that emptiness in death. But after it's all said and done, Wolverine emerges with the Predator's ceremonial blade, of which he plans to keep as a trophy to remember this fight that lasted over a century and to remind him of his keen edge every day of his life going forward. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill but that'll do it for this one guys let me know your thoughts down in the comments below and we'll do it again on the next one all right later